Thank you, Annie. Um, Annie will throw a copy of the PDF, um, the entire presentation in the chat. And like she said, typically they're recorded. You can watch them if you have to leave early, no problem. Welcome everybody. Good evening. My name is Courtney Kowalchuk. I am a therapist. I specialize in adolescent and um, child um, psychology and uh, mental health. I have been doing these uh, classes with the district uh, for probably like eight years now. If you guys have any feedback, we are going to offer a survey which you can tell us what you've liked about either just this course or the entire 10 session series or what you like, what you didn't like. So please give us feedback on topics, things that you'd like to learn about in future courses or uh, classes, because as far as I know, we'll, we'll do this again next year, I hope. And um Annie's nodding, so I hope that's the case. Yeah, and so we want to hear from you guys, and we want to approach topics and material that is important to you. So please let us know. Um, alternatively, yeah, I, I like to do this in kind of a discussion format. I will ask some questions here in the beginning and kind of hopefully get parents sharing and chatting. If you don't feel comfortable sharing on your mic, you can throw whatever comments you have into the chat. I try to read those pretty consistently. And if I miss any, Annie does a great job of uh, reminding me or throwing yours out there. I think that one of the best um, positives of this course is that we get to um, we get to brainstorm parenting uh, struggles. I was gonna say failures, but that's not a good word. I don't like that word. Um, just struggles, yeah, we get to do this together. Uh, I am an expert, so I do uh, hope to give you some information on how to how to try some new things, what to try, hopefully put, put some of your fears or your mind at ease when it comes to uh, adolescent mental health. And today we're going to dive into a conversation that's very important to me in my practice when I work with people. Like I said, I'm a therapist and I've been specializing in adolescent and child mental health and therapy uh, for over 10 years. As social media and technology has gotten more permeating into our lives, it's become more of a passion of mine to teach parents how to approach this subject uh, in terms of parenting. So let's go. Let's dive in. Like I said, if you have questions, feel free to stop me, throw it in the chat, just start talking. I'll get the picture uh, for uh, one small housekeeping thing. If you guys would all check your mics and make sure that they're muted because sometimes we get a hot mic and I don't want anybody to feel embarrassed. So, okay. What we're going to get started off tonight is with a quote. This is a quote by David Amerland. And I'd like to have a small discussion about this, what you guys think about it, what you like about the quote, what you don't like, if you can relate to it what kind of feelings or thoughts it, it it brings up for you. Social media is addictive because it gives us something that the real world lacks. It gives us immediacy, a direction, and value as an individual. So... Before I go into why I chose that quote and what I think about it, I would love to hear from some of you parents. Um, if anybody wants to share, what does that make you think of? What do you think about the quote? What do you think about this idea that social media is addictive? Because it's given us something that, that the real world doesn't have. Uh, 
I can share. Um, Please do. So, so my son always tells me that, um, like he likes when I, you know, ask him about screen time and everything, he's always saying like, because that's where like, he feels like, you know, no one can see him and like, he feels valued, he feels important, like if he's gaming or something like, you know, it obviously makes him feel good about himself, where that makes me think like, maybe he's not feeling as good or valued in other places. So, um, you know, that's something that kind of strikes with me is just that it, you know, it's giving him like a purpose for like whatever he's doing and getting passionate about. So, um, you know, hopefully we can find that in other ways too. But um, I found that to be, you know, one of the things where I'm like trying to understand where he's coming from a little bit more than just to kind of immediately shut it down completely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that comment, because I, 100% I've heard this um and 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 hopefully this conversation will give you some peace of mind in in just the sense that that is what most particularly like preteens and teenagers most kids that I run into and and the research supports this too they describe technology and social media as being like their social connection. It's and and what I specifically heard you say that your son, and I don't know how old he is, but that he identifies with it as like, this gives me value as an individual, right? This gives me some sort of meaning or purpose. And if you take that away, that's bad. Right. And as a parent, it's like, oh gosh, it makes you kind of scared to take it away. And so one thing I will say is I think that's very common and typical of this age range. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay. Uh, I think that these things are kind of designed in a specific way. And most certainly this is the effect that it's had on young people. Um, maybe an unintended effect at its creation, right? I don't know that when they created it, they they recognized that it, it was going to do this psychologically to children. And so I think that this can be a good thing. We can interpret this as like, okay, cool. Like this is something that our kids have grown up with. And it's very different because we didn't, right? And so there's a little bit of a disconnect there or a gap there, I think, because we can't really understand like, well, how is this giving you purpose and meaning? Like it's a device, right? Like, and especially with all the things that are coming out in the news and on Oprah and, you know, the surgeon general and all that stuff. It's like, oh gosh, this is really worrying me. So I hear you. I, I think that that's a really valid concern as a parent to be like, oh gosh, well, we got to get, we got to get this somewhere else. And, and yet I'll try to normalize that a little bit by saying like, okay, we could work with that. Like that's okay. Um, it's not a bad thing that he's feeling that way or that our kids are feeling this way. And yet I think the precise point is what you said. We, we got to give them this somewhere else too. And so, yeah, we don't want to just like completely pull the rug out, out from under of them, especially if they've grown with social media and it hasn't been delayed because now we're kind of hopefully as a culture and as a community in science, we're, we're, we're shifting and hopefully it's becoming a shift that in the future, we're going to delay social media and technology use for a lot longer than maybe we did previously. That's my hope anyway. Um, and I do think that there's some, some momentum, like I said, with, with Oprah and with, uh, you know, different really popular things in culture. So yeah, I, long story short, I appreciate you making that comment. I, I can really relate that, that that's a little concerning and yet hopefully we can normalize that a little bit. It's not a terrible thing for our kids to feel this way. And yet it's really helpful for us to know and then know what to do and how, how much we can set the limit without, you know, leaving them in shambles. Right. Cause I think that's probably the, the main worry. Anybody else? Again, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that with us.
I don't know. I, I may go out on a limb and just say in my own personal life, I will say, and this echoes my, my professional work with clients, uh, with patients who are coming to see me in my practice. I think a lot of us as parents are even addicted to social media and I'm kind of lumping you'll, you'll find today I'm lumping all internet use in with social media. So that could be like Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, um, really, however else you get entertainment on your phone, TV, like stuff like that. Um, so with this broad definition, I, I do think that all of us to a degree are addicted. And I think it is because it's kind of become this maybe coping skill or this way for us to just kind of like that immediate gratification to kind of like escape from life or from stress. It's kind of like a thing we do when we're bored. Um, so I chose that quote for this reason, because I do think that most of us, if not all of us can relate to our kids in that way, that it does give us some sort of like immediate gratification. There is definitely a social aspect to this in terms of value and connection and comparison, right? There's, there's some psychology behind that. So um, I chose it for that reason. And I hope that at the very least, we can start off there as a group of parents, just common ground that like, this is really hard and it's affecting everybody, not just our kids. Any last comments or anything about the quote or social media's uh, addictive qualities or because it gives us a direction or value before we move on. Okay. This is another question for you guys. I hope that we can get some parents um, sharing or being a little bit vulnerable today, tonight with everyone. Um, my question for all of you is, how has your child's use of social media or screens and technology, how's that changed your life? How has it affected your parenting? And what are the biggest challenges in terms of social media and technology in your family or your life, your kids' lives? That's a big question. You could answer any part of that. Well, I'll just start again too. Um, I think it's affected our lives as um, not being able to do as much as a family together because I've seen just like the addiction, like you said, whether it's with the adults or with the kids and trying to like be on your device or when you're tired, just kind of gravitating towards that instead of just kind of breaking away and mm -hmm. spending more time together. Um, yeah, I appreciate that, Jennifer. Um, yeah, it, it kind of feels like it, although, competes. say that again. I said, it's kind of like competes, I feel like, like I'm competing with technology for attention. Yeah, yeah. You know? No, and I, I feel like, I feel like that's, that's really relatable to feel like you're, you're having to compete with that. And it's almost like, can I win? You know, can I, can I win if I'm being compared to this thing? That's like, it's, it's got a pull to it. Yeah. And I think for me, at least, um, I think I just don't get as much information about, um, you know, I'm getting into middle school. You hear less, I think about kids days, you know, how was your day? What'd you do? Who you're friends with? You really have to kind of dig, but, um, mm -hmm. I think it's like, you're just kind of losing kind of or at least I feel like I'm losing kind of like that place 
in my child's life where it's like, oh, we were talking so much, but now like we're always competing with this thing that's in your face all the time. And, and, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, it feels connected. I guess that's the word connected. Yeah. Oh, what is such a great, like interpretation of, of, of that and what's going on. Right. Because I think that you're right. Totally. Um, I mean, we're all kind of basing this on our own experience and also the experience of maybe compared to what it was like before or our own experience, but definitely losing that connection or that ability to just like have kind of candid conversations and engage with each other. Um, I think what you're bringing up is, is really, like I said, it's really relatable. And, and I do think that that's probably one of the most problematic challenges that a lot of parents face is like, I can't compete with that. Right. And, um, it's interesting that you say that because sometimes I'll even notice this personally. I'm sure some of you guys do, you notice it when you're out, if you're out somewhere and you look around, um, just kind of notice it at, at some point who else who's on their phone and how many people are not right. You might be like the solo person, not on your phone, standing in line at the coffee shop or, um, you know, getting takeout somewhere or at the doctor's office. Um, because I'm a therapist and I do this for a living, I, I notice this, right. I notice uh, Sandra, I think your mic is on. If you guys could go ahead and everybody could mute their mics, uh, it would be so helpful. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. So, so I think if we're looking around and we kind of notice like th this connectivity issue, I think is, is happening large scale, right? People are not uh, talking in line or, or, you know, communicating at events or, um, it, it just feels like we're kind of narrowed, um, one of the biggest challenges that our, our, our scope or our attention span has narrowed. And yeah, that connectivity between family members or strangers, or, you know, I, I do think that that's a big deal. So thank you so much for sharing that, Jennifer. Sure, Sarah, thanks. Yeah. Sarah says it's hard because it is an addiction and our kids see it and they do what we do. So all they want to do is be on the TV, iPad, phone, gaming, especially when it was a way to help them feel like humans. When we all had the pandemic of COVID, that's all they know. It's hard teaching them that there's more than being on those devices. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Sarah, I think you're a hundred percent right. Um, the pandemic and the way that we all shifted into having to do our daily lives did not help at all. This kind of maybe dependency on the device. And I think we're definitely going to be studying this uh, in terms of psychological effect and uh, societal effect and things like that for many years to come. Uh, that's usually kind of how we understand things. We get it late, right, in the scientific world. But definitely, uh, it's it's kind of normal now. This is the norm. And what I hear her saying is it's like, they do what we do, which is a really, really fabulous point to make, which is, I've said this the whole series, if you guys have been to other classes, our kids don't do what we tell them to do. They do what we do. And so uh, Sarah is absolutely right that if we are getting sucked in, which I will kind of teach you guys some language on how to use this with your kids, but like if we're getting sucked in and they see that, that's what they learn. That's what they mirror, right? Okay. This is normal. And so it's, it's definitely hard as a parent. And I'm glad that we can start out here. Parenting in and of itself is hard. And this whole thing with screens, I think has taken all of us by surprise and, and like the world by storm. 
because we didn't, we didn't realize, like I just said about science, right? We, we get, we get it on the back end. We, we can't, we don't know what we don't know. And so now we're kind of going, oh, this is the effect. This is what's happening. And I don't know if you guys have been seeing some of this stuff in the news, or like I said, on Oprah, if any of you guys still watch TV or things like that, it's getting put out there now that we're recognizing that there is some science being done and there's some, some kind of alarming, um, some alarming data at the very least. And I will share that stuff with you guys. So I don't want you guys to feel like this is a, a two hour class where we like dog on social media and technology because I, I, there are some benefits and we'll talk about some of that. And yet tonight is really about how to, how to limit and set boundaries about that. Um, and so you will hear some of the negative impacts and negative, negative, um, yeah, the, the pitfalls and the negatives of social media, because it's slowly becoming my passion because of all of, all of the data that's coming out. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for sharing. I think you're absolutely right. They, they mirror what we do and we've got to change things too. Um, none of us, none of us realized that this was coming. None of us, you know, we weren't prepared and that's okay. Um, Sandra says, unfortunately, the addiction is quick. I've been in disability, started to notice the time I spent on the phone is crazy. Rapidly, I'm engaged in videos per hour. Definitely. And like you said, if you struggle with some sort of disability or you get injured or something happens, it's it's even more so, right? Um, it, it can really suck us in. And I do like to use that language because the technology is designed to do what it does to us. And instead of internalizing those behaviors, like I'm bad, I'm addicted, I'm bad, there's something wrong with me. It is an externalization of that, which is social media and technology is doing what it's designed to do. And if we can kind of put that off of ourself, there's a much more palatable way for us to deal with that, which is like, talking to our kids about it. Like, man, can you see how it's Saturday morning and we got sucked into the TV. We've been watching the TV for three hours. Like, Hey, let's, Oh, we got to shake our bodies out and turn this TV off and go outside. It sucked us in. Right. Like it does that to everybody. Like, this is how the TV works. It does that. Cause it's all, you know, sparkly and colors and like fast, like that's what it's designed to do. And so just having that language and teaching our kids in that way, depending on how old your kids are. Um, yeah. Giving them the information and arming them with that is like, you're not bad. There's nothing wrong with you. You are not do you know, in somehow in some way defective or a failure because you've become addicted to this thing. That's what they designed it to do. And it's working. Right. So that's another really kind of helpful tip to get past some of that. If some of you are feeling some guilt, I know I feel guilty when I scroll and I lose a period of time that I can't get back. I feel guilty and I feel saddened by that. And so that, that kind of is some of that research too. Most, if not all people don't feel better after they get off of a, uh, you know, a spiral or a spurt of technology use. Most of us tend to feel worse. Um, and that's kind of what the data is, is supporting. Okay. So last part of the question before we move on, what skills or strategies, since we've talked about some of these like major issues, what skills or strategies have you guys learned to help you through if you've learned any and you could throw out some things maybe that you're most interested to learn about tonight. And I can make sure I hit those points if I'm not already planning to do that. Sandra also says technology, it's reading your mind. So you get caught in all the things that you like or want. 
Oh, it must be difficult for teens to think out of the AI world. Definitely. So there's the algorithm. Like I said, it's, it's designed to work in a specific way and it's, uh, it's been designed really well and it's working really well. And the, the impact on psychology and looking at this from a psychological perspective is, is very alarming. So thank you for that input. Anybody else have any skills or strategies that you've learned or anything specific you want to learn about tonight that I could address? You can throw that in the chat. That way I can make sure I get to your interests. If anybody's got any awesome skills or strategies, feel free to share them throughout the conversation. Okay, the objectives for tonight, I want to help you guys identify concerning issues with social media and technology use by our kids. We're also going to appreciate the positives because there are some and there is balance. I want you guys to be able to explore ways to improve their relationship with screens. We're going to review some research. I'm going to give you some evidence regarding the impacts of screen time on child and adolescent development, which is the most important part for that has shown the negative impacts on uh, child and adolescent development is my that's my number one. So I will get into that kind of a lot today. So feel free to ask questions. I also, obviously these classes, you can network with other parents that are also struggling to, to foster that responsibility and balance for, for your kids. It's one of the best things about these groups is that you can feel not alone. You can get ideas from other parents. You guys can network if you'd like to share your numbers or reach out to each other. Um, I will say maybe that was a lot more common when we were meeting in person, but we haven't met in person for a long time. I think this is a lot more convenient for everybody, um, which is really interesting because obviously we're all on screens. Um, okay. So I think that this was last year, the Surgeon General Advisory Report came out. And at the end of the slides, I believe I have a link to that if you want to read it in its entirety. This is very long. It's a bit dry. So what I did is I summarized some of that stuff for you guys and basically hit the main points. One of the biggest things that was said in that article, and I quoted it, there are ample indicators that social media can have profound risk of harm to the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents. I put that in quotes for a reason. I took it word for word for a reason. And the reason is because that, like I said, is the driving force behind this being a passion for me, which is I've worked with kids, you know, children and adolescents for over 10 years. I worked with Rady Children San Diego Outpatient Psychiatry Clinic for many of my beginning years doing this. And I didn't know this then. And the fact that we know this now and there's solid data telling us this has a profound risk of harm to the mental health of our kids. That's enough for me. And so I, I hoped it was enough for you guys. Uh, there's not enough evidence that this is deemed to be safe for children. And so that coupled with those ample indicators that it's going to have a profound risk of harm that's really all it takes for me is that I'm a mental health specialist. I am an expert with child, you know, children and adolescent psychiatry. This can't keep happening. Um, I work in schools. I have a private practice. I do parenting. Um, I'm working on a parenting masterclass, like in my own stuff. I want to share this with everybody I know because it's that important. Um, and like I said, this is new. Social media is relatively no, new in terms of us having this kind of access and our children having this kind of access. So um, brain development is the most critical factor in determining that risk of harm. So like I said earlier, that, that, quote, that quotation, having that profound risk of harm is based on how it impacts brain development. So they're not just kind of like throwing that statement out there. You're going to get some basis on what, you know, how they came to that conclusion. 
what we do know, and if you've been to any of the previous classes, you might feel like some of this is repetitive, but I talk about child and adolescent brain development almost in every class because it's pertinent to all of the issues that I've talked about, sleep, depression, anxiety, uh, coping skills, mindfulness, all that kind of stuff. Those are the topics that I've done. Um, and we, we always want to talk about brain development because this is ages 10 to 19 is the most highly sensitive period of brain development. And, you know, I was doing some research on younger kids cause I have younger kids. Um, I have two kids under five, so under four. So, um, I'm all about that, like preventative zero to five range. And they're basically saying, I think zero to zero to 19 is the most highly sensitive period of brain development. So this is talking about ages 10 to 19 specifically. And the reason for that is like puberty, right? A huge brain change happens when puberty happens. And so period. What the Surgeon General Advisory came out and said, another quote, is that frequent social media use may be associated with distinct changes in the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that is responsible for emotional learning and behavior, and the prefrontal cortex. And you guys probably hear a lot about the prefrontal cortex, or maybe you don't. I talk about it a lot. Prefrontal cortex is like the secretary of your brain. It's where impulse control, emotional regulation, uh, planning, uh, like long-term moderating social behavior, all of that is happening in the prefrontal cortex. And that's very underdeveloped in children, right? We talk about that not being developed until your kids are around 25. And so this can increase sensitivity to a lot of things, but specifically rewards and punishments. And the reason why we talk about rewards and punishments is because this is pretty critical when we look at addiction, right? Uh, reward and punishment in the brain is very highly associated with addictive behavior, which is brings us back to that quote in the beginning. So distinct changes in the brain are happening with frequent social media use. Adolescent social media use is predictive. We're finding, this is backed by the evidence and the research, social media use by adolescents is predictive of a decrease in life satisfaction, satisfaction for certain developmental stages, particularly for girls. It's that like pre-pubescent, pubescent period, 11 to 13. I would even argue like 10 to 14 now, we're seeing earlier puberty onset and 14 to 15 year old boys. So what we're finding is girls before they ever enter high school are de they're, they're finding a dramatic decrease in life satisfaction. And that means so much, right? If you can take a look, if you could just imagine if my 11 year old has a dramatic decrease in life satisfaction before she ever even hits high school, that is breeding ground for like a smorgasbord of other issues, right? And so these are some of the things that are coming out that I'm the most concerned about. The research is saying about how it's affecting kids in school. Being in super competitive games for a long time seems to me it's making my child think everything is a competition and he's so worried about being perfect or made fun of. Yeah. And so affecting kids in school in terms of like their behavior or their social interactions at school or their academics, because what you're describing is um, comparison and, and perfectionism, right? Which is, there's a little bit of anxiety um, in the perfectionism realm, when we talk about that in terms of mental health, right. And that what you're talking about comes from comparison, right? They're, they're looking at what other people are doing on social media, which is not real by the way, right. It's not a real picture of someone's life and they're comparing themselves and we can never match that. We can never meet that. Right. So, um, 
Yeah. You could get a little bit more specific with your question, Jennifer, but um, I'll, I'll share some more information about how it's affecting kids in school for sure. Um, but that's a very understandable and relatable thing that it makes sense that that, that would happen, right? Okay. So I talked a little bit about the recent news and the things that came out in the Surgeon General's uh, Surgeon General Advisory, and I'm I'm going to kind of um, change gears here and talk a little bit about the benefits. Um, I kind of feel like this is um, interjected at a, in kind of weird timing, but it's because I don't want people to feel like I'm stomping all over social media. I do feel like with the evidence, there still is the reality that it has been helpful. There are some benefits, right? So some of the benefits, and and you might even share some of these stories with your own kids, um, maybe kids who are super anxious that maybe have started meeting friends online um, because that's, okay, great, Jennifer, I'm glad. Um, yeah, one of the benefits is online friendships. And this is something that obviously is not possible without social media, right? There are kids that I know that know people across the country uh, um, that they've met or they maybe play sports with or, you know, they are in clubs with and they get to have conversations and maintain friendships in a completely different way, right? It's not pen pals anymore. Like they're able to communicate. They're able to FaceTime, um, I think that's something that we didn't put on there either is like FaceTiming with friends long distance. I think one of the the most um, positive experiences that comes out of social media is that ability to stay connected to family that's far away. If you really value that, you know, your kids can be seeing that from a really young age and seeing grandma and experiencing grandpa or or cousins and aunts and uncles. So online friendships or family, yeah, th this is a great benefit, being allowed to have that social outlet in a positive way, connect with somebody, do some FaceTime, see someone that you haven't seen in a really long time. This is considered a benefit. Um, one of the other really important things is the wealth of knowledge and information. I'm sure you guys remember you know, back in the day when we were in school, how we had to look things up and we're like, oh, I don't really know what that thing means or, or you know, who uh, the governor of Alaska is or, you know, what the state bird is of Florida or whatever, right? You, you, you had to, you used to have to go to the library and look it up or find books or, right? We don't have that experience anymore. Um, and so this wealth of knowledge and information is a fantastic tool for our kids. It's amazing. It's, it's awesome. Um, and I think if we teach our kids to use social media or technology as a tool, that's something that I talk a lot about with my own clients is like teaching your kid to use social media or technology as a tool to help you access that wealth of knowledge or that information teaching them how to look for scholarly articles or look for um, and vet, you know, their, their resources and what they're looking for and how to look up interesting facts or things that they're interested in or how to make things or, or do things right. That's, that's priceless. It's invaluable. And that's amazing. It's, it's a really positive quality um, of social media. This other one, development of social connections, that kind of goes with online friendships that we've already talked about. I think more so that was like um, in the Surgeon General Advisory, they did want to talk specifically about some of these things in more depth. And so without getting on too much of a tangent, the reality is that um, some kids maybe would start playing video games and they would develop social connections uh, in an appropriate way with kids their age in said gaming rooms or servers. And that was a new social connection. It wasn't just a friendship with somebody that they've already met. And so I think there's a caveat to the development of social connections on social media and technology. And that is 
making sure that those people are real people and not predators, because we do know that there is um, a large base of predatory behavior and uh, a real risk for predators with kids on social media and technology. So the reality is that with supervision, kids can develop social connections. They can meet kids that they that don't live in their area, that like what they like, that have some similarities. And that's uh, also unprecedented, right? Before, before this time, we would have not been able to do that. Self-expression. So some kids I have met with in the past, they're really into music and they can make their own music and host their own music and they have their own channel. Those things are awesome. Um, that's a great way for a child to express themselves, of course, with limits and, and boundaries and with the caveats of lots of supervision, depending on their age, but it's amazing for kids to be able to do stuff like that, you know, host a website with all their art or, uh, engage in poetry writing or, uh, any, any types of that stuff. Self-expression on the internet is, is a big thing. Um, so in the Surgeon General Advisory, there was some, some research that was uh, targeted towards the buffering against stress amongst marginalized youth. So racial, ethnic, sexual, and gender minorities, there's uh, more, more research is needed in this area, but they did get a lot of responses like from the participants and in specific research studies that basically with these marginalized populations, the use of social media was said to buffer against some of the stress. And so without reading more into this and kind of going through each study specifically, I think the reality is that there's a huge likelihood that there could be some advocacy or some connection to specific groups where those kids feel more supported than in the community or in the, you know, small collectives that they're in. And so that's a total uh, benefit of social media or technology to help buffer from some of that stress, particularly if kids are um, marginalized or ostracized because of race, ethnic background, sexual or gender minority, like choices, those, those kinds of things. Um, I will kind of close this out with the benefits of social media. While there has been some research, it's very under-researched and understudied. And my hope is that we're picking up the pace for that. Um, I think this is kind of how things work. When something's introduced to society, we kind of learn more about it. Oh, there might be some issues with the way that we're using it. Um, some of you guys, we might remember like smoking cigarettes or like some of these things were kind of okay or thought to be helpful at some time. You guys maybe have seen some of those old ads where there's pregnant lady smoking and it's like, oh, these make me feel so good. It reduces the stress. It's like, whoa, like smoking, we know it's so bad for you now and we would never want pregnant women to smoke. And yet- Right now, social media is understudied. It's under-researched. And so I, I kind of feel like we're in that space with society. Um, we have to do more research and we have to recognize how this impacts both us, our kids, communities, societies. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be really important to do that. All right. So last but not least, there is limited to no benefit for zero to five years old. I just wanted to put that out there. There are benefits as kids get older, particularly school aged and above, right? And yet there's largely no benefit for zero to five years old. So if you've got really young kids, there may not be a ton of risk depending on how much they're watching or how much they're exposed to, but there is limited to no benefit. Um, and that hopefully can help you weigh some of your decision making and parenting when you look at that fact. Okay. Again, kind of going back into some risks. So we've looked at some of the benefits. Um, I think if anybody else has any they want to share, benefits of how social media or technology has affected your kids. 
Um, I do recall like one of our parents shared in the very beginning that like her son feels like value and um, kind of purpose within social media. And to me, that's a benefit, right? If somebody gets purpose and meaning or um, that sense of value as a person, that's great. I want to support that. Um, I think there's a way to do it, right? That's healthy and that's balancing benefit and risk. But if anybody were to tell me, man, this gives me like such good feelings. This makes me feel, you know, like I'm valued when I share this or I talk about this or I do this or I read this. I can't argue with that. Now, as children, sometimes they think that they like something or that that something is doing something for them. And yet they're not fully able to weigh that. Hey, what's the benefit? What's the risk? Okay. I might get a little bit of benefit from doing X, Y, Z, but then I get this whole risk of all this or this negative with this other thing. Right. And as they get older, and this is again, why younger kids, we should delay it because they, their brains are not able developmentally to make those comparisons or those choices yet. And that kind of brings me to this conversation that up to 95% of children and adolescents, and we're talking age 12 to 18 or 13 to 17, up up to 95% of those kids report using social media daily. Nearly a third report using it almost constantly. So a third of kids, right? Because we're talking 95%, a third of children are using social media almost constantly. And in my view, there's some underreporting going on here, right? We always know that when we're talking about, um, you know, some of the the, the barriers or um, pitfalls of studies, like a third are using social media almost constantly. And I think this goes back to some of our parents feeling like they're competing. They can't get, you know, they can't get a word in ed- edgewise. Their kids are constantly kind of wanting to do this thing. Look at the screen, uh, check their TikTok, look at the videos, scroll, um, watch something. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's both anecdotally we can see that. And then the science is telling us that as well. It's confirming that. Although 13 is the minimum age for most platforms, right? Talks about like Instagram and TikTok and all these websites or or platforms are saying, yeah, you have to be 13 and they put in their birthday. And yet this is saying 40 plus percent of kids eight to 12 are reporting that they use social media. So the minimum age on the platform is 13, but all these really young kids, uh, younger kids are still using it right? Almost half. Um, Social media and technology and the use to this degree doubles the risk of experiencing negative mental health outcomes, particularly depression and anxiety. And to me, I've done a class both on depression and anxiety separately in this course. And if any of you guys came to that and any of your kids are struggling with that, I'm like right here with you. I'm I'm sorry. I feel for you if your parent your kids are going through that or if any of you guys are going through that because this is really hard. And another really um big catalyst for me doing this is that I see the connection in the data and anecdotally that that social media and technology has on depression and anxiety, right? this is my expertise. I see kids and adults, uh, all day, every day who have depression and anxiety and one, almost 100%, a commonality is that they're using so much social media. And so we're going to kind of jump into the childhood development. I've, I've talked about a couple of these points just as we've been progressing. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I just have a question. I wanted to find out if 
there's any research on how social media impacts relational aggression. Oh, yeah. So there is. Um, they've talked a lot about, um, it depends on age, right? What, what age specifically you're looking at. But I don't know if you guys remember, um, maybe this was like early 2000s. There was a lot of um, kind of hype hyper headlines about gaming and aggression, right? There was that whole thing that came out. Um, they definitely have found that atypical or what we're talking about, lots of social media use is absolutely correlative to tantrum intensity in kids, right? Uh, aggressive behavior in school age kids. Um, it doesn't, it's not um, exclusive to gaming, violent gaming and things like that. So that's also something else that's really interesting is that kids or toddlers that are exposed to a lot of, we're calling it all social media, right? Blanket term. Those kids are still, we're still seeing a rise in aggressive behavior, right? And it's not just having to do with violent video games. So yeah, th there are some research studies on that. If you're interested, uh, when I stop for questions at the end, I could uh, grab some resources and put it in the chat right. for you. I, I, yeah, I, I was um, referring more to like girl on girl hate and competition. Oh, yeah. You're talking like um, teen girl or maybe preteen girl interpersonal, like bullying or yeah, just conflict. Yes. Yeah. So right off the top of my head, I can't think of any studies specific to that. However, anecdotally, I see it 100%. Um, the reason I say that is because these girls in different girl groups and friend groups are on Snapchat or they're on TikTok and they're using those means to bully each other, right? Or they're recording somebody doing something or there's a, an easier way to access each other via direct messages that are erased or, um, yeah, I, I would be super interested to to find some studies specifically related to that. And I can certainly do that for you. And I think what we could do is um, at the end, I can either try to quickly kind of locate some or I can get Annie to email them out. And I think that's totally, yeah, that's totally reasonable for us to do that. But but like I'm saying, anecdotally, 100%, I, I would agree with you. There's There's... Um, it's a new way, right? To, to be behind the screen, do some bullying, it disappears. There's different avenues for that. And um, yeah, I see it a lot. I see it a lot in the schools that I work at with girls, particularly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. That's an awesome question. <laughs> and again, this goes back to like, we need more research too. Um, so if there's not any specific studies on that, we, we need it. So we talked a little bit about the brain not being completely developed until 25, right? We know for girls, this happens a little bit sooner, boys typically a little bit later. Um, we talked in previous classes also about, um, like the pruning of neural pathways, right? The brain prunes neural pathways that aren't being used. So for example, if we have a lot of kids that are maybe becoming more sedentary and they're not doing certain skills or activities, those are being replaced by screens, phone use, TV, computer, laptop, Netflix, like whatever it is that they're doing, the brain's pruning those pathways, right? I always try to tell people, think about 
if you've ever seen those like planet earth shows where the ground is blanketed in snow and you see this pathway of like wolves chasing maybe some reindeer, right? They're all going on the same path. They're not spreading out and trying to chase through this deep, deep snow, right? That's the idea that your brain is pruning these neural pathways that are not being used. And the activities that you do as a child, they change your brain, right? So this is that idea that like, we want them to have a breadth of experience doing different activities, different skills. We don't just want them doing this one thing where they're having the exposure to screens, where they're watching a lot of TV or movies. They're engaging with kids in a certain way or gaming. Um, yeah, we, we want to expand that because the brain will essentially like rewire, right? And we can do that. That's the great thing about the brain. There are four critical factors for healthy development. The four of those are movement, touch, human connection, and nature. So when we talk about healthy development for children, we talk about movement, right? There's so much to be said for kids running and playing, particularly out in nature, right? That's the fourth one getting dirty, exposing themselves to the soil and, and to the outside air. There's a lot of data on this movement, which is I've, I've tried to really push this with a lot of parents, which is don't think of it as vigorous exercise, right? It doesn't have to be vig vigorous exercise because they'll say like, oh, my kid doesn't like that or they don't enjoy sports or it just has to be movement, right? This might look like walking, it might look like yoga, it might look like dancing, it might look like playing outside, it might be, it, it can be a combination of these things, right? It does not have to be vigorous exercise. Touch, which I think a lot of us are getting so much less of, um, particularly some parents might, uh, mentioned the pandemic and, and the isolation and the lack of human touch. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard the studies with the neonate like babies in the in the NICU once they started realizing that babies who were massaged or who were touched daily recovered um their improvement was vastly greater than those who were not touched right we know that human beings need touch we also need human connection right we need social interaction and interpersonal strong healthy appropriate inter interpersonal relationships and yet one thing that's really lacking when it comes to social media is real genuine appropriate human connection right and there is something to be said of of like we talked about the development or the maintenance of of friendships or family relationships and yet um, human connection, being with someone, looking at someone real time, learning social cues, playing, those things are invaluable for kids, for their development. Like I said, nature. So getting in the soil, getting dirty, playing, kids learn all, all of the skills that they need, right? Problem solving, brainstorming, like I said, taking turns and all those social skills, kids are learning that by playing in nature with another kid or with someone else. Um, and so having those four things and using that as the foundation for what does my kid need, right? These are the four critical factors. And I would argue some of that human connection or some of that movement can be with the use of a screen or with the use of, right? Like I talked about a lot, uh, FaceTiming family or making those connections. Some of that could be with the use of screens or the use of social media. I would say, assess your own situation, your own child's uh, experience with these four things. What are they lacking? What are they low in? What are they really, really high in? Um, some kids might do great with movement and not so much with human connection, right? Just kind of assess your own child and ask yourself, which of these factors are we lacking in? 
Uh, I talked a little bit about this when I was working with Rady Children's. Um, like I said, I was seeing this in real time. So this was probably anywhere from six to 10 years ago, I was working at Rady Children's and we were finding this to be true. Unprecedented rise in referrals to occupational therapy for learning delays, developmental and attention disorders, and behavioral problems. So like I said, we're kind of, um, there's kind of a, what would you call that? Like a delay or a gap, right? In the research. Um, there were dramatic increases in um, behavioral problem, like referrals coming into the psychiatry clinics, uh, developmental disorders, right? Neurological disorders. And I think all of us at the time were like, wow, what, what's happening, right? Um, and so what we know is that delays are on the rise. There's dramatic increases in motor delays for infants in the last six years. And so what we try to say is like, what is this correlated with? What is this being caused by, right? And so some of the research is telling us that that social media has a, a part to play in this. I don't know that we can say necessarily with 100% clarity or, or full faith that like 100% these rises in referrals and delays are 100% associated with just social media and technology use because I don't think that's the case but I do feel like it plays a part. And so with delays on the rise, what we wanna do is again, look back at that movement, touch, human connection and nature. How much of that is your child getting? And if you do have a child with some of these things, does your child have any exposure to screens? And what's that exposure level like? Talk a little bit about toddlers and preschool age children. Um, like I said earlier, there was a, a parent that asked about interpersonal relationships, and that was almost geared towards like um, preteen and teenage, maybe girl bullying and kind of uh, the use of social media to be mean to each other. Um, this is from a different perspective, younger kids. Um, there's a lot of research coming out that toddler tantrum in intensity and frequency is correlated with media use. Um, zero to three years old should not be exposed to screens. Elementary age should be limited to one to two hours daily. Um, toddlers and preschool age should receive at minimum 180 minutes of physical activity a day. So obviously that's looking like much more physical activity than screen use, right? And some of us, I feel like, are kind of on the opposite, especially considering routine or resources or structure of the day or like what you need to get done. Um, there's going to be some tips to kind of encourage more movement and more physical activity, more play, especially for younger kids, right, than older kids. So here's some facts that kind of led to this growing health concern, I think. I told you guys that I've been seeing things with, like I said, Oprah had a guest who, I'll share his book, the name with you guys. Um, she had a guest on her show who was talking about this growing health concern. And I feel like this is cool because this is like the momentum that we need, right? If there's just a bunch of like kooky psychologists talking about how screens are bad, if we don't have like Oprah on our side and we don't have this like visibility, I feel like we're not going to get any traction. So here's some facts that have kind of led to this, I think. Um, kids are using entertainment technology on average 7.5 hours a day, and that doesn't include educational use time. So if we look at like the time they're awake versus the time that they're sleeping, right? Uh, if we maybe say hopefully anywhere from eight to 10 hours sleeping, the rest of the day, they're using a lot of technology 
on average, seven and a half hours a day. And we know that a lot of schools were using screens, were, were using different apps or, you know, uh, platforms, programs to, to teach. This doesn't include ed educational time. So then you might add so many hours on top, depending on where, you know, where your kid goes to school and what grade they're in and all that kind of stuff. Um, teens are spending nine hours with multi-screens. So the teens, we're saying kids using seven and a half hours, teens spending nine hours with multi-screens, the number's more like 11 hours. So multi-screens, meaning they're looking at more than one screen at a time, or say they're doing something like watching TV while they're on their phone, or they've got, you know, their laptop open with the TV going in the background, um, 11 hours a day teens are spending using entertainment technology. Um, something that was noted in some of the research that I found is after just nine minutes of a fast paced TV cartoon, that's not face paced, that's a typo. Fast paced TV cartoons, the study showed immediately immediate decrease in cognitive function. So it takes it takes a short amount of time of these types of media that are again being designed in this way. Another parent mentioned like the algorithm is getting getting us, right? They're designed in this way. Just nine minutes is all it takes, right? And there's a, a an immediate decrease in cognitive function, which means focus, concentration, ability to problem solve, things like that. We find that with internet or gaming addictions, when the brains are scanned, there's atrophy in the gray matter, right? Which you guys know what atrophy means. If you don't use a muscle, it starts to atrophy. It like dies, right? We can't use it anymore. Technology use of greater than five hours a day is linked to neurological pruning of the prefrontal cortex. So I talked about that a, bit, a little bit already. Um, using technology in excess of five hours a day, it prunes the prefrontal cortex, which means less emotional regulation, less planning, less long-term uh, thinking of long-term consequences, right? All like the secretary of your brain. If you're using more than five hours a day, which we already said, most kids are both younger children and teens are using more than five hours a day. That means there's pruning, right? We're losing access to that. And so again, that goes back to like, these are some stuff that I think these are the things that are starting to people go, oh, like this is not good right? Doesn't mean that this, there's no going back. There's no healing from this. Absolutely. The brain, especially particularly with, with children and adolescents, we call it uh, high plasticity, right? Uh, very malleable, very, uh, very flexible and adaptable. So that's great news when it comes to kids. Um, they did find violent, this was something I was talking about earlier, violent video games are, are a causal factor right? So when we talk about studies, people say like correlation is not causation. We're not talking about a correlative factor. We're talking about a causal factor. They've actually been able to, to find evidence that video games cause an increase in aggressive behavior, aggressive cognition. So thinking about being aggressive or more violent, having that type of mindset, right? Uh, that type of maybe psychological change. Um, aggressive affect, which essentially just means like mood, emotions, right? More aggressive mood and a decrease in empathy and pro-social behavior, which essentially would mean less empathetic, more antisocial behavior, right? And so when all that came out in the 2000s and there was all this stuff, of course, with school shootings and kids who were engaging a lot in things like this, I think that was kind of how it was primarily headlined. What we know now is violent video games are causal factors for these things, right? And there's so many kids that are playing at a very young age, Call of Duty and all of these, like, I, I don't know, even the half of the names of the games, because I don't particularly uh, engage in those or promote that sort of thing. But if your kids are playing violent video games, 
regardless of age, right? Even if they're a little bit older, we find that there's still this causal factor in behavior, cognition, affect, and in the way that they um, see other people. One of the really interesting facts and statistics that I found was that a lot of prison inmates are spending more time outside than the average child, right? This was in the Surgeon General Advisory pamphlet. So if you're interested in reading more about that or seeing some of those studies, you can go into that and, and read it in its entirety. Really what's happening, I think, is there's this sedentary shift, right? Technology and social media is typically, there's a sedentary nature of this, right? We're usually sitting or laying, we're sitting, we're not moving around and doing things, right? While we're on our social media, it puts kids at risk for obesity, for, we already talked about the prefrontal cortex thinning, right? So all of that, like, um, planning, emotional regulation, all of that stuff, right? And I think one of the biggest things is this is the direct opposite to movement, which we talked about one of the, the four uh, foundations of healthy development is movement and technology and social media is kind of inherently sedentary. Most of us are not moving while we're doing it, right? There are certainly some programs or certain games or certain things that are designed to be walked around while you're doing it or or things like that. But the typical nature of social media and technology is uh, sedentary. Uh, one of the most upsetting things and statistics that I learned, and this is not to scare people or to, to a fear tactic by any means, I'm just giving you the research. The most alarming thing for me was the exposure to pornography and, and sexual predators. The age is now six years old on average. And you know, this is one of the things in um, psychiatry that we're doing, right? We're assessing for exposure to pornography or sexual material. And six years old uh, is way too young, right? We know that that's way too young for kids to be exposed. It puts children um, at risk of kind of a host of other, you know, sexual natured issues. And the reality is that this is one of the main reasons why we need lots more supervision, particularly if your younger kids are using social media. We need, you know, social media companies to like really crack down on age limits and, and figure out how to do this, right? Uh, there's some responsibility uh, that needs to be um, allocated so that our really young kids are not being exposed to sexual material, particularly pornography and predators, because it's just, to me, that's unacceptable. Uh, I don't care how we slice it. Six-year-olds should not be exposed to sexual material. Um, and so we're finding that that's now the average exposure, that age. Okay. Okay. So I've gone really heavy on the data and the research and giving you guys, hopefully arming you all with information, stuff that maybe you didn't know before. Um, if you have kids that can, you're going to be the only, the best judge, use your best judgment. Can your kids, can you share some of this information with your children, right? The, the information about how this is impacting their bodies, how this is impacting their brains. If you think that your child is able to understand it, I think that 100% you should be sharing this information with them because what we're doing is we're giving power to our kids by saying, this is what it's actually doing because they probably don't know, you know, yeah, they might say, oh, if I watch too much TV, it's going to fry my brain. Or like my mom tells me not to look at the TV too much or like, let's give them real information. Let's give them the data. Let's say hey, you're 12 years old, like here's this conversation that we need to have about your phone or about, you know, you using TikTok or like, this is your foundation for talking to your kids and then setting limits and boundaries with them. And then even saying, including them in that process, hey, after I've told you all of this information, what do you think is fair? What do you think are some good boundaries for our family? What do you think are some good limits 
to set for ourselves, because I think we all maybe need to change this about our family, like our, our usage, you know, engaging them in that conversation. Um, my four-year-old, I tell her in a very developmentally appropriate way, a lot of this conversation, I talk to her about how technology and screens impact our brains and how it impacts our mood. Right. Um, and she, our kids can understand this because I think that they, they know how they're feeling, right. They know how social isolation and, you know, lack of connectivity and constant comparisons, they know how that stuff makes them feel right. Um, they're feeling it and they're the expert on themselves. So just having that conversation, I hope is something, if you take anything away, take away some of that research and some of that data just to have the conversation with your kids. Because I think, again, that's empowering them. That's empowering our kids uh, to take their own life in their hands and say like, I, that. wow, that I didn't know that before. I didn't know that it does that thing. Like, I don't want that to happen or I don't, I don't want to feel that way anymore. Here's how I can change it, right? Um, okay, so setting limits. I'm going to kind of um, go into this part of the presentation where then we talk about setting limits, some resources, tips on lowering exposure, um, all that stuff. And then we'll get into our feedback survey and time for questions. So, so far, does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Do you have any questions particularly about anything else that you think I can answer off the top of my head? I'll just pause for like a moment to see if we get anything in the chat. Oh, okay. Looks like we might. Okay. Um, let me make sure. So somebody galaxy a 51. I have an almost 19 year old. I'm going to try, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do affect our children if we choose not to give them a phone or tablet, only TV? I regret not doing it early or early. So I'm not sure. Is Do you have a question? Is it, are you asking if you should give them a phone or tablet or only have them watch the TV? Okay, a five-year-old. So if you have a five-year-old, the, the recommendation, and I will um, give you more of an explanation of this. The recommendation from the Surgeon General Advisory and those people who've done the research say that from zero to five years old, there is no benefit of giving them phone, tablet, or TV, any type of exposure to screens. Okay. Now, anecdotally, and also personally relating, I have a four-year-old and she is allowed to watch only the TV. We don't let her use the phone or a tablet ever. She's never used one. Um, we have a lot more data on 
young children watching TV or being exposed to the TV, right? Which is different. It's far away. It's typically slower paced. If you can find some slower paced TV shows or, or movies and it's within limits, right? And she doesn't have access to that. And there's no exposure other than what I put on the TV. So it's a little bit different. Um, it's really hard to get anything done as a parent if you have young children and they don't have any of that stuff, right? This is probably a lot of the reason why parents are using screens for young children because they need to get things done. I totally can relate to that. I understand that. And so here's the thing. I wouldn't ever give a five-year-old or younger a phone or a tablet if you can get them to have limited time watching a TV show, you can research slower. There's a lot of um, websites and information out on slower TV shows because what we're looking for is slower frame rate, less um, less frame rate change, if that makes sense. So the change between what's happening in the show or what, like the slower the show, uh, the better it is for, for a child's brain, right? We're, we're finding that really fast paced, rapid, lots of colors, lots of crazy sounds. Those are the kinds of things that I would avoid at all costs. Um, so the recommendation for your 19 year old is going to be, you're going to have to engage in that conversation with him or her as an adult, right? Give him this information. Hey, what do you think we should do in terms of like boundaries and limits for ourselves? It's self-care. So as an adult, teach them that, right? With your five-year-old, you can take that, um, those suggestions. Again, the science doesn't support giving, giving kids that young screens or having any exposure. And yet I get it, right? And it's kind of culture. I'm sure a lot of us can remember we watched cartoons on the weekends or whatever we were watching as kids, movies, right? Things were so much slower than the storyline, the frame rate, the colors, the excitement, all of that was much slower. And so if you can get some old things to watch, you can show really young kids, maybe some older things. Um, that would be my suggestion. I hope that, that I answered your question. Um, she says, I got my daughter her first phone at 13. Now she's 19. But with my son, the question was that if I don't give him access until he's 17, will it affect him? Um, so a lot of this goes into like values, personal values and family values. Um, if you don't give a child a phone until he's 17, you're not going to negatively affect his development or anything like that. Um, he is going to, because of society and culture, it's going to affect him socially because kids are going to say like, oh, you don't have a phone, right? Like, well, that's weird. And, um, he'll have to learn to deal with that and that will affect him. Right. Um, but we're not talking negative, uh, psychological, or mental health outcomes. We're not talking about this negative impact like we are with the exposure to social media, right? So I think having him learn how to deal with the social the social context of not having a phone like everyone else does or not having a smartphone like everyone else does. Yeah, that that's much, uh, that's the preferred um, struggle that I would, that, that I would prefer or suggest. And so, yeah, the reality is like start early, delay smartphone use until they're older. Um, you can, and I get into all of this, but it's not going to negatively affect his development if you wait to give him a phone. I think quite the opposite. You'd actually be doing better. And, and then there's always the argument with your kids, the rebuttal when they get upset about it. Well, you didn't do it for her. She got a phone when she was 13. It's like, hey, we didn't have the research then. I'm, I'm learning all of this today. Right. And so, um, as your parent, I have to keep you safe. And now I know, right. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that helps. Um, and again, this goes back to like, you guys remember, this is a, a presentation in the context of I'm a therapist and I specialize in, in this right. Adolescent and child mental health. And so, that's why I would make the suggestions or strategy, use the strategies that I'm suggesting. 
because I have that angle, right? Um, and there's a lot of information and a lot of providers, a lot of people out there that have different suggestions. And I think people do what works for their families and what works for them. And I'm in no way going to shame, judge, put any negative label on anybody that does that. I think we all as parents have to do what we feel is right and best for our kids. So there's that caveat too. You're so welcome. Okay. Okay. Let's jump into how to set limits. If anyone else has any qu other questions or specific situations that you want me to uh, address, please throw it in the chat. I'm going to try to get uh, through the rest of the slides and give you guys some time at the end to fill out the survey. It only really takes a couple minutes, so it, it's largely going to be this information. Okay, how to set limits. So I talked about this earlier. You're going to start by assessing the overall health of your child, okay? And I'm not asking you to do a psychiatric evaluation or full assessment like I would do, but just ask yourself these questions, okay? How is my child eating? How's their appetite? What kind of things are they eating in the day? How are they eating, you know, healthy meals? Are they getting access to those? Are we eating, you know, any meals as a family? Assess that. How's my child sleeping? Are, do they have good sleep hygiene, right? I did a whole class on sleep hygiene. If you missed it, the great thing about these is that they're recorded and you can go check out the YouTube channel and watch, watch the one on sleep hygiene. Are they sleeping in a healthy way? Are my kids moving or are they exercising every day? They need to move, right? And again, this isn't vigor. It doesn't have to be vig vigorous exercise or sports. It could just be moving. Are they spending time with families, family or peers? Are they invested in keeping it when their schoolwork and their homework? Do they spend time on hobbies or extracurricular activities? Okay. So like, remember, this is your, um, your criteria for healthy development. Do they have human connection? Do they have movement? Do they spend time in nature? So ask yourself these questions. And just kind of, okay, maybe they're lacking in this one, or maybe they're not doing great on this one. Maybe they fight me on this one. I'm going to get to that message as soon as I'm done with this. Um, yeah, ask yourself about that. Um, I have a parent actually was just talking about the difficulty in saying no to social media and games is the social element. If all their friends connect only through Snapchat and online games, it makes it difficult to deprive your child of social engagement with their peers. How do you advise to deal with this? So Tamara, thank you so much for your question. It's a good one. It's a hard, it's a challenging question. And it's also probably not a great answer or at least not an answer that's going to be really popular because the reality is that from a psychological standpoint, my child's brain development and their mental health is incredibly more impactful than the social element of being out of the loop or disliked or not as popular. Um, and that is kind of it. Uh, I would say that's my professional opinion based on the data. And so that's the unpopular opinion number one. The other thing that I have to say about that and how to deal with this is it's going to be, it's going to have to be, and I think it will be my hope in the next couple of years, this will have to be a cultural and societal shift, right? Um, there's a, a big movement. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about this. I'll give you some resources. There's a big movement for, um, phone free schools, right? Uh, there's, there's going to have to be a shift in society that says that's not the norm, right? Um, connecting on Snapchat is not the norm. Okay. And like online gaming, Snapchat, TikTok, all, I'm kind of lumping it all into one. Um, it's going to have to be a societal shift and the societal shift starts with us. Right. And so um, the more this kind of takes hold and the more parents and, and administrators and people, you know, educators, people in schools recognize like this is not good for kids. 
we are doing something or allowing something to happen that is not good backed by data. It's not good for their, quite the opposite. It's not just not good, but it's, it's bad, right? It's negative for their mental health. If we can get everybody with this momentum to say like, okay, yeah, that doesn't feel good. I don't want this to keep happening. Let's change it. Right. Cause we changed it in order to get to this point. Right. So that's how we deal with it. And on a, on a family level, the advice or I guess strategies, cause I don't really give advice as a therapist, the strategies are you as a parent, use your just your best judgment. You use the data or your own family values to back your parenting choice, right? And um, you could maybe start exploring other groups or communities that go screen-free or that don't have smartphones and kind of see what those kids are doing and how they're dealing with it. The reality is that it will, particularly if you haven't delayed the use of phones on the onset, on the front end, it's going to be hard, right? Expect resistance. And if you can, ex if you, if you tell yourself up front, this is going to be hard. I'm going to expect that, that this is going to be like, they're going to feel it's like the end of the world. They're going to resist this, right? They're going to oppose it. Just take that as a given. If you prepare yourself for that, right? You're in the right direction because it's like, okay, I already know they're going to resist this. They're not going to like it. And yet depriving them of the social engagement, like I said, is not even on par with the negative aspects. So there's also a way that you could, depending on your child's age, um, allow them to use social media as they get older with supervision, right? Uh, the terrible thing about Snapchat is that stuff disappears. Uh, that's why I think there was another parent that was kind of asking about um, there are some things that can be tracked and supervised and there's some apps that, that can't. Um, and again, I haven't used Snapchat in years personally, so I don't really know how Snapchat works anymore, but my knowledge about it in the past was that those messages disappear. Right. And so any of that stuff that can't be supervised again, that that's a, a, a parental decision about how you supervise your kids. And also know upfront, this is very difficult. This is very difficult because of what, uh, what society and culture we've adopted all of this as the norm. And so you're going to expect resistance. And I think you're going to have to push through the resistance and talk about that with your kids. Again, prep them by saying like, here's all the information. Here's why I'm doing this. Here's why we have to change this. Um, engaging with maybe other families or other parents that have already done this or are doing this, right? Um, it doesn't mean that your kids aren't going to get social uh, engagement because most kids, like I said, it, um, I'll get to this on the next couple of slides. I hope that it helps answer your question, Tamara. Um, you can replace the smartphones with flip phones, right? That's what a lot of this movement is doing. Um, because you still want your child to have social engagement. And a lot of parents are like, Hey, them having a phone, like I, they have to call me to like, for me to pick them up or like that is understandable. And we're at a place in time in society where that might be a non-negotiable. And so they have a, they have a flip phone, right. Where they can text and they can call, but they're not, they don't have the uh, features that the smartphones have. And again, that's going to be really different. They're going to be looked at as like, oh, that kid has a flip phone. That's weird. And yet the reality is, you know, when your kids can understand that and they can kind of explain it. And hopefully as this shift happens in society, this won't be weird anymore. Right. And it's a heck of a lot easier on the psychological development of your child to be weird or to be the odd one than to deal with the negative impacts that are being shown to happen from social media. So um, yeah, assess overall health. Sorry, we got off on a little bit of a tangent, but I hope that was helpful. I know that's probably a question that a lot of parents have is like, how am I, how am I going to do this? This is going to be weird and hard and, and that's kind of my best answer, which I said is not a great answer, but it is what it is. Um, and 
I would be also here for you guys all getting support in that because this is going to be hard and challenging should you choose to do this. Um, okay, so replacing smartphones with flip phones. There's some examples. They have actually all kinds of new companies that are coming out and making these phones that look like smartphones or resemble smartphones, but are not. And that's kind of giving us some of that oh, I'm not going to have the weird kid who has a flip phone and all the other kids make fun of him. It's like, oh, this looks like a smartphone. They'll probably even be able to pass it off as a smartphone, right? And they don't have to share that with everyone that they don't have a smartphone anymore. So there's some cool things happening in that space in terms of people uh, wanting this to be okay uh, for their kids and, and not socially ostracize them or make them weird. Uh, so I talked a little bit about this in that, conversation with this parent was supervising technology use. So you should have all their passwords, um, share passwords, right? Keep devices in a central location to be used together. Um, oh, okay. Like it's social media time, right? And we all get to go on our phones for a little while and you kind of do it as a family or you do it like individually as one parent to kind of like go your separate ways and you do it. And then that way it's like, this is being supervised. Like you, you can't just go get exposed to something or be in these conversations with somebody or like be exposed to porn or, or predators or uh, bullying or any of that stuff, because it's like, it's being supervised. Right. Um, I think this is incredibly important with younger kids. And then I would even say like 15, 16, when they're finally getting access to this stuff, um, yeah, this is going to be important to like teach them. And then you obviously form that trust with them, right? Like we've supervised them for this long. They've shared their passwords with us. We can give them some privacy. And yet we've kind of built this foundation of supervised use, keeping the devices all together, right? There's off limits areas. This is another way to set limits, which is like, there's no phones in the bedrooms, um, I know that's probably like a complete opposite for a lot of families. I know there's a lot of kids that are using phones like into the night, right. And just scrolling and kind of watching things and doing things. So, um, creating off limits areas in your house is going to be really helpful in this idea of like paring down social media use or exposure. Um, like I said, collaborate with your kids about the limits, the rules, the expectations up front doing all of that groundwork and then expecting resistance. They're going to hate it. They're going to not like it. You're going to, you're going to get some pushback. And I'm also sure as parents, you know how to handle that because you've had it before, right? You've had resistance of, about other things. And if you can set the limit, you share the information, you collaborate with your kids, you set the expectations, and then you are consistent with them, right? It'll be resistance in the beginning. And just like everything, that'll level out and they'll get into the groove. And then we won't, you know, you won't have this conversation or this struggle again. We're, we're, we're going to find a way to kind of, to deal with that. Tips on how to start. Okay. So I recognize setting limits is really hard. Being consistent with them is really hard. Boundary setting is something that a lot of us stray from because I call it the path of least resistance we're tired, we're exhausted, we're working, we're, we're moms, we're dads, we're parents, we're co-parents, you know, we're doing a, a myriad of things. We're trying to keep ourselves healthy. Maybe we're trying to move. We're trying to drink our water. We're trying like, I'm sure you guys have seen those memes that are like, I'm trying to do everything in my day, you know? And it's like a lady working out and drinking water and eating her food. It's just like, it's impossible. It's hard. Right. So I get that. Um, and the reality is, start with compassion. This is hard. I will not come on here and tell you do all this stuff. And like, it's all really easy. And like, just do it now. Like not at all. This is so hard. It's so hard. I told you my four-year-old, she watches TV. She, she earns TV time on the weekends because that's what I feel like I have to do to like do a little laundry and cook or clean my house. So yeah, like I'm starting with compassion. This is what I need, right? And that's what my what works for my family. And so starting with compassion to yourself, like there's no judgment, there's no blame, there's no guilt, there's no shame. It's like, I'm compassionate to myself because this is where we're at. We don't, we don't know what we don't know. 
um, how do you relax and how do you teach your kids how to relax? Right. So like, start there. Look, I get it. Like we all need to like, cause maybe some kids, a lot of kids will say like, oh, I'm just doing it. Cause it like helps me relax or it helps me feel good. And it's like, okay, I get that. Like I get it. And we can have a, a limit and a boundary and a way for you to get that. And then in the other times, how are you going to relax? Like, let's learn how to do, I taught you guys mindfulness. If you came to those classes, if you didn't, you can check those ones out on YouTube, uh, the recordings, help them find ways to relax. Right. Um, and start with compassion in that conversation of like, I know this is really hard and this might feel really bad and really weird. Right. For a while, we might feel like the weird kids or the weird family who doesn't do this. Um, and like, I get that. Right. Starting with compassion is going to going to go a long way. Um, modeling, right? We talked a little bit about that. Our children don't do what we tell them to do. They do what we do. So our own screen and technology addictions, I'm raising my hand. I'm being vulnerable. I'm working on that myself. I do not want my kids to see me on my phone scrolling. It's just a personal value that I have. And so I have to model that. Um you know, anytime my phone dings, I don't want to run to my phone and get it or be scrolling mindlessly or, or, or just like engaged in something else. Maybe it's not mine. Maybe it is mindful. Maybe it's like, oh, I have to order that thing from Amazon or I have to check that email or do that thing. But it's like, I want to be present. Right. And I can give myself set times of the day where I can do the things that I need to do. And it doesn't model to my child to be always accessible to my phone. Um, if I'm using screens, then you, or if you're using screens with the family, you can offer it as a bonus, right? With upfront set limitations. Again, this is always about like talking to your kids about it first. We don't want to just do it and pull the rug out from under them. Uh, brainstorm alternatives. So help them again, help them find ways to get social connection or help them find ways to feel like they belong or to find purpose, right? You are going to help them brainstorm those things because they really can't do it by themselves. They're kids, right? And they need our help. And so if you guys could do that together, hey, what else do you think would give you some purpose? Or what else would make you feel valuable with your friends? Or, right, like start that conversation and help them brainstorm other ways to do that. Um, keep a schedule. And you wanna keep a schedule of like entertainment times and days. You could, like it says, like do a movie night, right? So you're going to keep a track of like, okay, every day on the weekend from five to six, we have entertainment time and we're going to all do it together. We're all going to like watch our favorite videos or go on our favorite social media platform. We're all going to like giggle for an hour and like laugh at the memes and send them to our best friends. And it's going to be a family event. Okay. So like, that's one way to keep it creative and keep it fun and be engaged and connected. And you guys can share them with each other. Right. Oh, Hey, huh, this is funny. Like, look at this. It, it's just another way to do it. Right. Keep a schedule of that stuff and emphasize connection, right. Emphasize connection with family, with friends. Oh, Hey, like, what are you going to spend your time doing? Are you going to like email that friend you haven't talked or like DM that friend you haven't talked to in forever, or maybe send them some, some videos you really like, like emphasizing connection in those moments or just in general can really, really go a long way. Stay the course. That's my best advice. It's going to be really hard. If some of you guys remember like sleep training your kids when they were really little, like stay the course, right? Don't guilt trip yourself. Don't debate with your kids. Um, you're going to give them all the information and then collaborate with them. It's not a debate once you guys have made your decision and you as a parent have made your decision. So it's just like, hey, I know this is really hard and here's some language you can use. I know that this is really hard and this sucks. Like, I don't like it either. And it's not up for negotiation. I love you. And this is what I'm doing as your parent. And, and if, if you want to talk about it and, and you want to get your anger out and you want to like, like I'm here for you. Right. So there's no debating. There's no guilt tripping. There's no like, oh, this feels shameful or like, oh, I don't, I don't actually, I shouldn't do this. Right. Uh, pick the right time. So like maybe on a Friday afternoon, you're not going to like throw a whammy on your family and change this whole thing dramatically. You might 
talk about it on the weekend and then say like, Hey fam, like, do you want to start this? We're going to start this on Monday. Like everybody's kind of we're Tuesday. We're coming back from the weekend. Like we had a good weekend, pick the right time. I don't know for your family, right? Gather data and reevaluate. So you're going to kind of do this thing. Hey, what's working? What's not? Does this limit we set work? You can gather data with your family and you guys can reevaluate it together. Hey, I didn't like that. It was only 20 minutes and that did not feel good. Like, can we do 30 or 60? Like, you know, again, collaborating with your family and your kids, particularly older kids is going to be really, really helpful to keep, to keep staying the course. Here's some helpful resources uh, on Android. I think it's called Digital Wellbeing. And on iPhone, it's called Screen Time. So you can use each one of those, those programs on the phone to manage screen time limits and things like that. John Haight wrote a book called The Anxious Generation. He's the one that I was telling you guys, uh, Oprah's Book Club. She came out and had him talk. And that book is really fascinating. It's uh got a ton of research um, that they have done. He's a psychologist on how social media is negatively affecting kids. You can look them up on Instagram too. Um, a thousand hours outside is another awesome Instagram. The gal is like, basically what they're doing is their motto is a thousand hours outside. Every year they try to spend a thousand hours outside. So that's like three hours a day, roughly. And, um, obviously in the winter time, this is harder, maybe in the summertime, you kind of make up for it. Uh, they actually log it and there's like little charts and things that, that you can get resources you can get for free to log that. Um, it's, it's really quite cool. Uh, sources for help. So recognizing that this is going to be challenging, right? I talked to you guys about this. Just expect that there's going to be resistance. It's going to be an uphill battle to start but this can become the new norm, right? And my hope is that as a society and as a culture, like we're shifting now because we're realizing the data is coming out and we're realizing that what is happening. Um, try to be consistent, try to be really gentle with yourself, right? This is hard and give yourself that compassion. Uh, Galaxy A51, the YouTube channel is up above. Annie can throw it in there again and she you can share it with your kids. That's awesome. Be informed. So the one of the resources is the full advisory link is right here. Youth Mental Health Social Media Advisory. It's long and it's somewhat dry, but there's a ton of information, a ton of studies. So I remember there was one parent looking for specific studies on that. And I would almost guarantee that there would be some, some information and some studies on that. If you want to click on that and try to find it. Um, I almost recall there being a really nice appendix where there's some really good, uh, almost by topic. Uh, creating a screen time contract. I have a link for that so that you can take that home with you. You guys can create that yourselves, collaborate, give them the information, collaborate on the contract. One recommendation that I have is using Wi-Fi timers and it powers off the Wi-Fi at night. You basically, you know, you guys have seen these. You can plug your Christmas lights into them, right? You can get something as simple as that. You plug your Wi-Fi into the Christmas timer and at a certain time it turns off. I have family members, uh, sorry, not family members, uh, clients or patients that I see and their parents, I've given them this advice, like get a timer and the, the internet will turn off, right? Put it in your room if you have to do what you got to do, but a Wi-Fi timer is like gold. Then no one's using it, right? It, it's, it's a limit that's not going to be fussed with. Uh, remove anything that you need to cords, devices, chargers, keyboards, in order to maintain the limits or boundaries, um, helping your kids, right. Brainstorming you and your kids find good replacements, right? What can we do instead of scroll on our phone? Can we go on walks? Can we meditate? Can we color? Can we listen to music? Can we dance? Can we do a hobby? Can we craft, right? Can we sew? Can we, whatever that is helping your kids find those things. More tips to lowering exposure, tracking and measuring your screen time, setting a goal and saying it out loud to someone 
uh, they actually find psychologically, if you set the goal, you say it out loud to someone, you're more likely to complete that goal. Uh, set a screen limit, use a timer, like I was just talking about, turning off notifications on your phone. Um, you can go in and kind of turn them all off so that you're not seeing what's happening and it doesn't have that pull, that same pull. Going grayscale, I have a couple of clients that I've actually used this with and they're like, I don't even like my phone anymore because it's boring, right? You turn grayscale on and it turns off all the color of your phone. It doesn't act on the brain in the same way. That's actually a really good uh, tip if you really find that you're struggling with getting off your phone. Delete time syncing apps. So like if you really spend a ton of time on Facebook or TikTok, delete them, right? Uh, pursue offline activities, create phone and device-free spaces. We talked a little bit about that. Like, okay, at the table or in the family room or in bedrooms, like no phones, right? You plug them all into a little basket on the kitchen counter. Um, avoid video fatigue. It's really just like watching things scrolling over and over again, right? This also was something having to do with when the pandemic was happening and we were all on Zoom all the time, like avoiding doing that, right? Taking breaks, talking to, to coworkers and bosses about uh, breaking things up. Pick up a new hobby. We already talked a little bit about that. Avoid eating in front of your screen. Read a book instead of reading on your phone or learning on your phone. Sometimes I even say delete the app off your phone and then you ha get your laptop out and have to use your laptop for certain things and it, it will make you use it less. Okay, we've got five minutes left. Please take the time. Annie's going to share hopefully the um, feedback survey so that you guys can click on that and give us feedback. I know I just like fired off information. It was because we were kind of running out of time and I wanted to make sure I got all of that in for you guys. Um, Annie shared the recordings and the survey. Man, that time went by fast. If anyone has any last minute questions or things that you want me to touch on, please feel free to ask or share. 